And I forgot to press the button again. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Horse Center. We've got Swiss Army Sean. Our guest tonight, as you can see, is Emma Jane Wilson. Emma, thank you for joining us. How are you today? I'm wonderful. How are you gentlemen doing? Doing pretty good. Well, we might as well start off with the news of the weekend. Did you watch the Kentucky Derby? Of course, right? Of course I watched the Kentucky Derby. You have to watch the Kentucky Derby. Mm. What were your thoughts about that race? Well, I mean in itself i mean every time you, you you know when i was a kid i used to watch the derby for saturday in may you're, you made sure you're in front of the television so um i did i had to rush home from the races at woodbine to, to make sure i could get there on time and as i walked in the door it was just on the television there so i was watching the ride and watching the race watching the trip and i was pretty impressed it was uh it i think everyone can say it it's it's nice to see the the um the, the long shot, the underdog, get the job done. Cause that's really what horse racing is all about. It doesn't matter how, how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much money you spend. You can, you can come from the, the, the back of the bus. You, the, the underdog can still get the job done. It's going to be 30 seconds to midnight, literally a Cinderella story, right? For sure. Yeah. Not too far off. Now, speaking of which uh, you, you write at Woodbine, but as a, as a little girl, you would say that your parents, you say your parents would drive you by Woodbine and you would look at the grandstands and you would think to yourself, I'm going to be there one day. So the first time you went to the jocks room, the first time you got on a horse, first time you went in the starter's gate, tell us what, I mean, how did that feel? Was that like, like you knew it was going to happen. So it was no big deal. Or was <laughs> like, Oh my God, I can't believe this is really happening. I, I definitely had an, Oh my God, I can't believe this is happening moment. Um, before I started really, truly, you know, gearing myself to, to be a jockey I, you know i told all my family friends that i was going to be a jockey and um uh, you know through a friend of a friend i i was hooked up with a trainer to try by galloping when i was but in between years of school i had no idea what was coming and i i went to work for at the time trainer tino attard kevin Attard. Is it me, Sean? No, we're having some issues. <laughs> okay, technical issues again. We were having a little bit of a delay earlier in the day, and uh, it looked like I was in a dub movie. So hopefully Emma will come back to us. Are you back to us? A little bit of a delay on your internet. Are you there? We're here. Can you hear us again? We are here. Can you text her, Sean, to let her know that we indeed are here? Can you hear <laughs> us or no? Technical can't difficulty. Hear you guys at all. Can you see us? All right. Can you text her, Sean, or no? Yeah. Uh -huh. Hopefully, she has her phone with us. But in any case, hopefully, they uh, it comes back up. And Emma, up oh, there she goes. So her internet should come back in a second now. And then when it does, it'll clear up. So in any case, Sean, we're off to a good start. <laughs> and of course, technical difficulties. Maybe it's because I changed my name to Rich Strike down there on the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how did you miss that? You didn't even put $2 on it, did you? No, to be honest with you, Terry and I talked about this a little bit this morning. But after, you know, it's just such a mad rush with all the picks and stuff like that, that it becomes really a, uh, a – I mean, I was um, – I was probably up, I don't know how many hours. Uh, I think I slept like five hours from Wednesday to Thursday or something along those lines. So I was just really using that time to to kind of take a rest. Are you you're back with us now? I think so. Okay. <laughs> but you, you were saying that as a, you know, it was a surreal moment. And as a little kid, you would tell everybody that you were going to be a jockey. And then the universe decided to close that story down. But now we get to finish it up. <laughs> so I... um. I started galloping for trainer Tino Attard and uh, Kevin Attard was the assistant and I had a chance to get on a racehorse. I had no idea. You know, I was on the back stretch at Woodbine. I got on and they told me, well, you know, we're going to go gallop this, this set. So we walked along through the back stretch. I followed the rest of the, the crew. There was about I don't know, five other riders. And I'll never forget. We walked through uh, Woodbine has the EP Taylor tour. Of course, there's the big tunnel. So from the backstretch to get onto the track, you have to go through the tunnel and up a hill. 
And I remember walking through this tunnel, following everyone. We turned to the left and we walked up the hill and I looked to my right and there was the grandstand. So here I am as an aspiring jockey, you know, dreaming of being a rider all my life, coming to Woodbine all the time. And I am literally on the backstretch of Woodbine. The grandstand is, you know, on the other side. And I, I was just flabbergasted. I, I couldn't believe I was walking on the race course, you know. So needless to say, that was probably, uh, <laughs> that horse was probably the only horse I didn't officially get run off with because I didn't think I was supposed to go that fast. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so I, I had to go back, regroup start with um you know where the horses went and a, a year and a half or so later is when i truly made my start at the track i, w I wasn't very experienced and i wasn't strong enough to do the job as an exercise rider at that time but it definitely stoked the fire to become what i i am today ah fantastic not only are, have you done well at woodbine but you also i mean to go from looking at the grandstands okay now you're apprentice you're looking out from the grandstand and through the tunnel and then the biggest race in all of Canada. You actually brought home the trophy on that as well. I mean, you talk about that uh, shining moment on the hill, I guess, right? What, yeah. was, what was that like? Well, Winning I'm, the Queen's Plate, which is the biggest race. Is it the oldest running race in North America, right? I believe it's the oldest continuously run race in North America. So we've never had any pandemics or anything, you know, shut us down. So um, we shifted around a little but um, Yeah. Canada, the Queen's Plate is is essentially Canada's Kentucky Derby. It means everything to a Canadian. And I mean, there's many Americans that have come up to, to to claim that crown as well. And when I was a young rider, it was it was one of those things. I wrote on my goals list that I wanted to win the Queen's Plate. And I remember writing that down and, and it was one of those achievable goals. But, you know, one of those things that I thought was 10 years down the road, you know, developing my career as a, you know, successful rider. And I would, you know, work my way towards that. Um, I started riding in 2004. I rode my first race, you know, near the end of the season of 04. And I had my first full season in 2005. So to have won the Queens plate only two years later in 2007, it was just mesmerizing. I, I was absolutely floored. Um, th those early years of my career were, were, more whirlwind. I mean, I was leading rider in, in 2005. I was leading rider in 2006. So then, you know, I was top of the charts as well in 2007. And to get Canada's horse race in as a feather in my cap was, you know, it just was, it was unbelievable. And everyone, you, you still, you, it, to this day, I've had that taste in my mouth and I still reaching for it every single, every single time, every single year, you're looking for that next three-year-old. Mm, and you, uh, you won the Eclipse Award as the leading apprentice. So, as you mentioned, you came out of the gates literally on fire. You mentioned that when you first came in, you weren't strong enough. So, what do you credit going from maybe not strong enough to be on the course to now you're the 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 Eclipse winning apprentice jockey? You're winning Canada's bigger race. All of that in the span of a couple of years. What do you credit that to? Oh, that's a really good question, and I I would boil that down to strictly just preparation. Um, I did a lot of work so that, that at those initial stages of galloping those horses, you know, that first attempt for like three days, I wasn't prepared. I didn't know what was coming. I didn't know what was required. Um, I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't aware enough. You know, there was so many things happening that was, it was overwhelming. So to go back to the beginning for me, I went back to school. I wasn't healthy. I had a back injury that was plaguing me, which, you know, I wasn't going to help. So I got myself healthy. I got myself fit and I decided to make a plan. That plan included, you know, going where the horses went, starting at a breeding farm, then hopefully a training center and then to the track. But that preparation and that planning, once I got to the track was also a key to my, you know, early success. Um, I worked hard. I did a lot of uh, training, modeling, uh, you know, watching races and, and seeing top riders, not just in Canada, but all around the world mm -hmm. and trying to model their styles, their habits. I used to plot races in terms of track mm -hmm. bias. I used to um, model out jockeys and, and, and their technical skills. We don't have, um, you don't have high school equivalent like high school football equivalent in racing you don't have college football equivalent in racing you dive in as an apprentice and you're against the pros and you have to be polished and ready 
So that was one of the key things. I wasn't going to get started until I was absolute ready. And I, you know, I was a student of the game and studied every aspect and every angle that I could so that I was primed and ready. I do think one of the key things that really helped me, was I rode the schooling races in New Orleans the very last year that they ever had them. So I had about 35, 40, 5 eighths schooling races under my belt, you know, that didn't count towards my apprentice. And some of the lessons that I learned in, in, in those schooling races were absolutely crucial. Emma, you bring up the apprentice. There's a lot of jockeys right now as an apprentice. They're doing really well. I know uh, Diego Herrera just lost it. Um, what would you give their advice once you lose that apprentice to keep moving forward and uh, doing as well as they did as they were with an apprentice? Uh, uh, my biggest thing is is stay stay true to what you know. Like stay stay the course. What you've done so far it, it has proven your success. So don't try and change anything. You you know you have had the opportunity as an apprentice to, you know, make those small mistakes and they can be overcome because of your weight advantage. So know what your strengths are, know what your weaknesses are and work on them, but don't try and change big things. Be, be confident in what's gotten you to this point and stay the course. I remember I, I lost my apprentice. Um, I went to England for, for two weeks. I rode the Shergar cup in 2006 and that over that course, I had lost my, uh, uh, my, my bug. And I got back and at the time I was doing really well. And then there was like a two and a half week stint where I, I couldn't win a race. And I remember there was a couple, you know, sayings that going around the backstretch. Oh, did, did Emma get back from England yet? You know, and so you just have to stay the course, be confident. You've, you, your successes is what's gotten you to this point. So just be, be true to that. When you were a young rider, who were the jockeys that really uh, helped you? Oh, I mean, there were so many at Woodbine that, you know, they're just by modeling and, and learning from them. Even those, you know, guys would sit down in the back room with the, at the Equisizer and, and watch the, the, the films with you guys, you know, old school guys like Richard Dos Ramos, Jimmy McElhaney, Robert Landry, Patrick Husbands, Todd Cable, like these guys, they may not have been my best friends, but they were guys that you could watch and learn from. I mean, at the time when I was learning, or you know, as a young rider, uh, I think it was just a year before I started riding, Todd Cable was just epic. He couldn't get beat on anything. And watching him ride with this confidence that just poured out of him was just unbelievable. But then I also had help from, you know, for example, Julie Crone. Um, I started off doing really well in, in 05 and Julie Crone actually gave me a, a phone call and, and we touched base. And there was a lot of little things there that she was really able to help me with um, technique and focus and, and, you know, little things like that, that were just unbelievable. And, you know, I was very appreciative of that day. I'll never forget that day that, you know, she called me up. I, I had the little piece of paper with all the notes. I was frantically scribbling everything that she could say to me down on a piece of paper because I didn't want to forget a single word. I read in another interview, when you don't have certain mounts, you like to uh, scare some of the jockeys coming back <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I am a bit of a prankster. Um, I do enjoy, uh, you know, having a little bit of fun. Uh, sometimes it's gotten me into trouble, but yes, uh, unfortunately, one of my absolute favorite targets is no longer riding. He's retired, Jesse Campbell. He is just as jumpy as they come. So any, you know, any time I saw him coming, I would just, you know, duck around a corner. I think one of these days I, I try to videotape as many as I can, and you know, with uh, uh, cell phones and the cameras that they have now, it's definitely very easy to keep those handy. So uh, I have a few of those, and uh, Jesse's been the target of quite a few. Have you shared them online? Uh, here and there, little bits, but I, I'm very, um, uh, I'm very respectful of my targets as well, and I would never post anything online without permission. So uh, mm. I think some of my better pranks, uh, I, I will will wait a little longer down the road. One of the best things, one of the best pranks I ever pulled. It wasn't a scare, um, but the clerk of scales uh, office at Woodbine is, I would say, twenty five by. 10 feet deep, decent sized ceilings, and it's a full glass room. Um, the last day of the season that we, the second last, like overnight for the, coming into the last day of the meet, uh, myself and a few other uh, people, quite a few other people actually gave me a hand. We filled it full of balloons. And I mean, full. Um, it took a while. We were blowing balloons up in the 
JBAC trailer on the back stretch, um, hiding them in the girls' sleep room, and then we just we just towed, <laughs> towed them all. We had three SUVs moving around. I mean, when when I pull a prank, I, I like to plan things out. So. You went big. I thought you were going to say you dropped out of the ceiling like and scared <laughs> the hell out of them. <laughs> it was it was tempting, but you know when when the clerk came in, it was full to the brim. Like you could it, you couldn't get in. We had plastic over the one door so that you know as you open it up, they all just came piling out. Um, so I documented quite a bit of it, and I'm sure one of these days it'll get online and uh, everyone will see my madness. No, we can make it an exclusive here if you like, right, Sean? <laughs> Absolutely. I gotta find the DVD. I would my TV department make up a little DVD. So that's sitting somewhere. We'll 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 um, air that one day when when we have permission. <laughs> have you noticed around the country how many young females have come into the game and have been lighting the world on fire? What do you contribute that to? Um, I think there's a lot of. Uh, there's realization. I mean, there's been bias over the years and, and, you know, it hasn't been that long that women have been in racing, let alone riding races. Um, so to see the successes myself, I mean, you've had Chantel on your show before, uh, Rosina Pravnik, Julie Crone, like the, the list goes on. You can even go internationally. There's, there's jockeys, female riders in Japan and in Hong Kong now, um, uh, France, Britain has had amazing female riders uh, over the course of, you know, the last, say, 15, 20 years as well. So I think that um, representation and, you know, young women seeing other women being successful, they can say, I can do that. And I think it's really important. And, and that representation gives those, you know, young aspiring riders the, the, um, the confidence that they can focus and, and give it, give it their go. And they're not going to be turned away just because of their gender. Do you have a specific distance track like dirt turf that you love more than anything else? Uh, more than anything else? No, but I do enjoy uh, the marathon races, like longer distance races. Um, Woodbine has implemented a, a marathon series. It's more of a starter allowance. So we've gone upwards of, you know, two and a quarter miles on the EP Taylor turf, which is fun. Um, the valedictory at the end of the year, you know, top level horses that are true stairs. The valedictory is a race that I've won a, a number of occasions, a mile and three quarters in, on the, on the main track at Woodbine synthetic. Um, and one of my, the first race I ever won at Ascot was a two mile turf race and to ride Ascot versus, you know, North American tracks is truly an experience because I don't think anyone appreciates the undulations and, and the, uh, the elevation that these horses have to, to go through. I mean, when you stand at the top of the lane, like watching Teppin come to the wire, I know how stiff that climb is and what she did black caviar when they ship there to run against these horses that run all the time on that kind of surface and that track, it's impressive. You're looking like straight up from the top of the lane, you straight, it's a three eighths of a mile turn in, you go up an incline, then you level, and then you go up again. And it's, it's stiff and it's testing and only the best survive. Hmm. So do you like marathons? Because as a handicapper, uh, when I would see your name on a horse, if it was a horse that was coming from off the pace, I was like, okay, I got this. Do you feel like that you're a better rider off the pace or do you prefer to be up front? Um, I prefer to do what the horse wants. Um, I I have been uh, labeled, I guess, as a, as a off the pace sort of rider, um, but I feel like I'm just as strong in a front running style. Um, I do find I enjoy having horses where I can get them, you know, a marathon style sort of race, the longer races where you can get them to settle into your hands, but yet be ready and primed. You know, you're, you're turning, you're, you're sticking them in in neutral and ready for second gear as opposed to just shutting them down so um you know it is it, i do like that and you know that late late burst of speed when you're running on end and you're picking up these horses um i feel like a deep closer or, you know the moderate closer is kind of like um super mario kart or super mario and you, you hit the star every horse you go by is like a little invincible star and and they pick up a little bit more a little bit more a little bit more and it's really neat to feel their confidence build and just that 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 fire that i'm gonna get the every single one of these horses and and you can feel them underneath you just being like yes let's do this it's it's fun 
picking them off one by one. Maybe it's just woodbine because I feel like in woodbine you have to have some late kick to come home. Um, you mentioned track bias before. Uh, Jordan says that um, as a handicapper, I find track bias very important. Do you have any thoughts on what causes it and how it impacts the way horses run? That's a very good question. Um, there are so many variables to track bias, especially uh, here in North America, especially at Woodbine. Um, I think one of the, the key things is is the weather as well as the maintenance. Um, a lot of people ask me about uh, synthetic surfaces, and I had a lot of questions about the synthetic surfaces when I got to Gulfstream. And um, one of the things that I find with synthetic surfaces and the way the weather plays is you have to remember that it is a wax based surface. And I always like to think of it like a candle and it responds based on how the weather is. Um, so if you took a candle and, you know, it's really hot outside, you light your candle, well, you get it really viscous. Over a period of time, it gets really viscous. And if you don't cool it off or blow the candle out, it's going to get gooey. So that's where you get that tiring surface. That's where I feel like there was a lot of um, horses in Gulfstream early on couldn't go wire to wire because that track was really new, really viscous. And so it was just so gooey. It was taxing and they couldn't quicken the way you would in a, in a front riding style. Um, then it started to even out where, you know, there was times where they start to water it. At Woodbine, when it's really, really hot, I know that they'll run the water truck over a synthetic surface. So you add a little bit of water to a, you know, a, a candle, that right balance of water, just a little, it can give you a little bit of where it's a little tighter on the top. And then it stays the same. It's a little more consistent. But add that to a big cold rain. Well, what's going to happen to your kennel? It, gets, it goes out really fast and it gets really hard because it cools. Well, that's what happens in, in the synthetic gets cold really fast, well, then it tightens. So that early fresh rain tightens that track up, speed will carry. But then you get to a certain point where you have so much water, if it's a deluge and, and you, you the, the, the track just cannot get through it, well, if you mix all that water, a lot of water into a candle, then it's just goop. And that's mm. where it feels like where it gets a heavier surface. So I think the weather is really important as to how it handles, especially obviously even with you know dirt tracks, you get your, your slop synthetics able to handle it more um and on top of that you can even maintenance maintenance can adjust for that as well so there would be times where you know you can see the track is a little tighter to the forepath i mean woodbine the last few days outside closers were pretty solid but then everyone starts to adjust and then speed starts to carry. So it's all the variables of where, you know, what are, what are guys going to do? They're going to take a hold because the first four races, it was outside closers. Well, then everyone starts, you know, a couple horses run on the lead. So there's too many variables to really boil it down to track bias. But a good jockey pays attention to those and will make adjustments. And you'll see it happen. I, I'm sure as handicappers, you can see the good jockeys adjust, maybe a race or two a little bit more than everybody else. Sounds like the moral of the story is when it's hot, bet closers at <laughs> Woodbine and Gulfstream, for sure, right? So Chantel shared a quote with us that I thought was one of my favorite quotes I've ever heard. Did you catch that when she told us about how lions don't concern themselves with the opinions of sheep? Where did that yes. come from? Um, that's um, actually, that's, I think, uh, what's her name? Uh See, she asked me that when I told her the, that day, and I couldn't remember. It's from Game of Thrones. And uh -huh. I think it's um, Queen Cer uh, Cer Cersei. I can't remember her name. She says it. And it's, you know, lions, the the, the land stirs for the lions, and they don't concern themselves with the opinion of sheep. And I thought that was very, um, It's it, it puts yourself into your own zone. It means that you can, you know, you don't have to worry about all the noise. You just focus on what you know and what's important. And that elicits that sort of confidence referencing back to say Todd Cable that can raise you to that next level of, of focus. Hmm. So how, I, I know you're from Toronto or around the suburbs of Toronto, but you spend a lot of time down in Miami as well, running at Gulfstream. So which track, I mean, I, Woodbine's your home. You said it's your home and that sort of thing, but what well, maybe What's the difference in terms of like lifestyle down in Miami versus lifestyle in Toronto? Oh, well, sunshine. Mm -hmm. Like they're so like, it's beautiful. South Florida is absolutely beautiful. Um, it's, a, it's definitely a different lifestyle for me a little bit as well because of um, 
my children were here at home while I was in Florida. Uh, they came back and forth a little bit challenged because of COVID restrictions and protocols, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, so it was a little bit of a, a acquired or lifestyle in that sense. But for me during the racing season at Woodbine, it's like, go, we were, once we get into the full swing, it's like four days a week, it's go, go, go. Um, lots of extracurricular with my kids on dark days and, and whatnot. Um, but in Florida, it's a little bit slower. And even through the winter for me, even the last few years of pandemic, I, you know, I stayed home and I focus more on a spring training style where I do a lot of, uh, workouts, a lot of training, a lot of weightlifting, a lot of cardio, um, just maintaining that overall fitness that you don't get when you're just riding. So um, it, it's it's nice to work out out in the sunshine, though, in South Florida. Yeah, I can imagine. Better than the cold of the north. I, mean, I live in Chicago and it's just horrible. I, yeah. I want to I want to maybe get like a you know, like when, when Acacia goes up to New York, maybe I can fill in for her down there. <laughs> there you go. For sure. I mean, I, I'm, I think you should push for that. I'll I should try. If I can. Oh, that'd be great. I would appreciate that. I'd love to spend some time down there. Uh, any other questions, Sean? Well, I got two questions you can answer either one or both. I actually hate the first question when I used to get it, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, in five years, where do you see yourself? And then also post race career, do you see yourself doing anything in horse racing? And what would that be? Oh, wow. That, they're kind of tied into one. Um, in five years, I still see myself riding races um, as long as I'm fit and healthy and, and you know, things are, are going as strong as they are now. I, I can't see myself making a, a change. Um, I have thought about a career after racing um, and I haven't decided yet. Um, there are many different avenues. I, I do really enjoy teaching young riders. Um, and I would love to make a jockey school of sorts. Um, but I mean, Chris McCarron had his school in Kentucky for a few years and, you know, it's kind of fallen to the wayside because I just think that the, the target market's so small. Um, but now with, uh, zoom internet, um, perhaps there's an opportunity to take advantage of that. Um, I have been helping through the pandemic, a couple of young riders here, um, through some video stuff as well. So that's been, uh, always been a passion of mine to teach. So, but I, I don't think there's much of a career in that. It's just something that I enjoy to do. I will say that's a question I get a lot on this page, actually horse racing today is I want to become a jockey. How do I become a jockey? And I don't know where really to direct them. Um, but I, you know, I try to tell them they just got to find somebody in the business to try to help. And if we can help, we'll help. But kind of hard when I don't know anything about them. <laughs> and, and you know what? That's that's how I got started. You know, my mom knew I wanted to be a jockey. She told her friends. I told, and, and actually, one of my mom's friends had met Sandy Hawley at a rotary meeting and mentioned my name. And he gave a few phone numbers. And that's how I got involved. Um, but I do think that any young rider that you know, any, anybody that wants to be a jockey and wants to be involved in racing, the first test to get involved, that's your first test to be a jockey. If you're tenacious enough to figure it out, to get it going, I mean, is the, you have to phone, make phone calls, you have to hustle, you have to make it work and you have to make it work for yourself. So if yeah. you can get through that first hump, then you're definitely on, on the right, on the right path. I forget who it was, or you could just jump the fence at Tampa. Who was that trying to tell us they jumped the fence at Tampa? I forget. Well, I don't, I don't yeah, remember. That. Yeah, remember? She said she jumped the fence and then somebody was driving by with her boyfriend and said, What are you doing here? She said, I want to be a jockey. And she said, Oh, good. My husband, my boyfriend's a trainer. I don't remember that. But who yeah, was I forget that? who that was. Mm -hmm. I have to go through the shows and remember that. So like Jordan, that. Jordan wants to know what was it like riding with the masks during COVID? Um, uh, masks don't bother me at all. Um, it, one of the things I enjoyed was, you know, for our restrictions, the way Woodbine had it set up was that we could remove our masks once we were loaded into the gate. Um, I did that quite a bit. Um, you know, it's not all that challenging. Um, but you know, you, you're getting dirt in the face, you're getting synthetic in the face or turf in the face. Um, in, in, at Woodbine, back in the day when we had dirt we used to wear like foam shields glued to our goggles to protect us from some of the you know the bigger clumps that would come up sometimes from the frozen surface so you know it's it's i'm a professional athlete you have to be adaptable and if you can't adapt to something as simple as that to to compete then just go home mm -hmm. yeah that's pretty nice easy so yeah uh john caravan robert Bryan, both remember it was julie crone 
I <laughs> thought it was, but I wasn't going to say it. Yeah, I was she, wrong. She told us she jumped over the fence and said, I want to be a jockey. So if, if you reach out to Sean and you say to him, hey, how do I become a jockey? Here's the answer. Go to Tampa, <laughs> jump the fence, <laughs> and wait for somebody to come by. It's all on you. Yeah, I'm not putting that in writing at all. I just put it out in the universe. <laughs> it's live now. It's out there. Hey, hey, there's no pulling that one back. So I'm sure I'll be getting a phone call from the folks at Tampa. They'll probably, uh, they'll probably evict my folks who live down there in Clearwater. But anyway, uh -oh. indeed. So, Sean, any more questions? No, I, I think that's it. Um, another great interview. And thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank we appreciate you coming on and uh, wishing nothing but success going forward and looking forward to talking to you again down the line. It was an absolute pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you very much for having me. Ours as well. Thank, Thank you. you. It was our pleasure. Have a great evening. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. As always, Sean, lots of fun, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Indeed. The things that you learn. I mean, I've learned so much on this show. And to learn finally how to handicap on the uh, all-weather track, to me, is that's worth uh, everything that we've done so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, actually, Woodbine, I actually played a couple this weekend, and I hit a couple. Literally, post position and jockey, and uh, take higher odds um, because uh, the favorites don't win too much there. Yeah, it was a mm -hmm. interesting. It's uh, always been a fun track for me. I've always liked betting at Woodbine. I feel like I've always done pretty well there because I, I feel like you, if you focus on horses with late kick, they seem to do better there because there's always those horses running late. The ones on the front seem to tire. I don't know if it's a long stretch or what, but or maybe just the surface. Well, but I've probably. done well picking closers there for sure. Speaking of closers, Sean, what do you think? Well, I, I, you know, I can't believe you always say you play the ones with your name, and you did not even put even five dollars on that. But I, I explained to you why. I, I was know, I, I was know. so burned out from everything that happened up in the week. I just well, needed some. Okay, so first. Working nonstop for three days to get stuff done. Then finally getting a little bit of a breather, but then it was my son's graduation. So got to get up early. Of course, you know, all the little things around the house that you got to get done before people are coming. You know how this works, Sean. No, I know. Right. I know. And then when people are coming over, then you got to go and everybody got, can you wear this? No, I don't want to wear that. Yes, you're going to wear that. I don't really want to wear that. So you know how all that goes, right? Right. So sure. then uh, then you go to the graduation, you come back and then you finally get a second. You think you have a second to breathe and then everybody starts showing up the house. Right. So for the past you know, two days, there's been nothing but people at my home. So finally. So, you know, when everybody kind of split and I had a few minutes to kind of just relax, all I did is really sit down on the couch and watch the race. So my thoughts on the whole thing was that was a tremendous ride. That that ride won the Derby. Um, if you look at the aerial shot and you can watch all the different horses, everybody chose to go to the outside, which was working better than the inside. Everywhere. Everybody chose the outside. The one I read or tease with Mo Dangle could have picked the same exact path Sonny picked, but he went to the outside and went like 13, 14 wide and got fifth. If he picks the inside, it's a closer race. Um, there were other horses that could have made the same run, um, but suddenly Leon. You won better that be race. careful, you know. I read. <laughs> no, you know, the bias was more to the outside than the inside, but the inside worked a couple times too. And he was the only one that said, "You know what? I'm going to wait for the rail." And then he passed Messier. He didn't. He didn't waste a second to go right to the outside of Messier. He didn't try to go. You know, some jockeys try to squeeze in there, and either it would have worked or he would have got caught up. If he would have got caught up, he would have lost all his momentum and he would have lost. So it was just a brilliant ride um and it just all all worked out um and you know looking back on it and uh, you know most people don't look at it because it's also in and i'm not going to say i would have ever predicted this horse to win but this horse did win at churchill 17 lengths and was the horse that was training probably the best what did we say all week about mike smith saying about the horse training well they said he didn't have any published works but he did train at churchill working really well but they See, said he didn't know. have any published works though they said well, that was one of the things that he's a horse that didn't have any published works yeah, I don't and know that, why they weren't published. Um, mm, I don't know if it's because he was the AE, you know. Mm, that's maybe. the thing. Just getting in Friday morning is really – and, you know, I had the thought, like everybody else, how is this horse only 80 to 1 with only finding out Friday morning he was in there, you know, everything else, and, and he goes on to win. And, you know, it's one of those things too, like, okay, it's great for Sonny Leone because he gets to ride the derby, but what are the odds he's going to do anything in here? And now his whole life has changed. Um, I'm after. sure. I I, th I just think that it's um, it's one of those things, Sean. It's it, 
I don't know. Like, you know, we have these conversations about destiny or things pre-written. Do they happen? It just seems to me when you think about the improbability of all of this, I mean, it literally is Cinderella story. The clock is 30 seconds away from striking from the horse, not being in the field. And 30 seconds before you get the phone call, Hey, you, you in, you out, right? Well, of course we're in, right? <laughs> you get the 20th post, which only one horse has won from before was a big favorite. You're 80 to one. The only race you've ever won is a maiden race. You're a horse that was claimed for $30,000, despite the fact that you did win. But you had horses like um, Epicenter just absolutely demolish you when you raced against it at Churchill Downs. So it's, I mean, it's just one of those things. That where, wasn't at Churchill, though. That race was not at Churchill. Was that at Fairgrounds? I think it was Fairgrounds, yeah. But still, you got pounded by like 17 lengths. So for all of that to come together the way it did, it's almost like it was written in the stars, my friend. It's just was one of those things that was meant to happen. The thing when I was watching it, though, I was kind of confused by this by the uh, apron, right? I was like, man, that was one crazy ass ride from the two horse, right? At first, because it was gray. Yeah. And then I said, wait a minute, that's not the two. I said, is that the 21? That's yeah. kind of like how I went through it. I'm like, it is the 21. I, I'm like, I oh, man. Sean texted me, LOL, you're in the race. Uh, yep. <laughs> you know what? You know what's funny? Both things. So, number one, that's the first thing I saw. When I saw an inside horse, I saw the two and went, really? The two horse? And it took me a little bit to, oh, no, it's the 21. And second, your whole thing, I forgot. Like an hour after the race, I looked at Hillary and went, oh, crap. I even texted Rich. He's in the race. And it was his name. And he didn't even play it. But it took me a little bit to digest all of it. Well, too. that minute, I was like, oh, man. Oh, bleep. Sean texted me. Like I said, it was written in the <laughs> stars. Rich, it's your name. And how many times have I said, if it's got your name, bet it. And I just so burnt out that I didn't do it. But in most any case. The, most of the people that won did like pick threes, pick fours, or doubles where they put all. And that's how they. Uh, well, you know, some, some people pick the, you know, just random generator. And they bet, like, let the machine make bets for it. And that's probably how it happened, right? Speaking yeah, of. It also it also sank because the fast pace. I'm thinking I really needed Barbara Road, and I'm thinking out of all the horses with the fast pace, you're thinking Barbara Road's going to be coming. So when you see that inside horse, I'm like, okay, is that Barbara Road or one of the other ones I need? And then no, it's the twenty. No, it's the twenty one. So that record set uh, that race set a record with 179 million dollars wagered, 17 percent increase over 2021. Is that just inflation or is horse racing? It is you know when you know what was the uh, you know the article where they where they put the wrong presidents one in the headlines? Um, do you feel like the headlines are just mis horse racing is obviously not dead? Otherwise, there wouldn't be 179 million dollars bet on one race. A hundred percent, yeah, it, it's not done. Um, I don't know what would be different this year. I mean, obviously, we didn't have the COVID stuff and stuff like that. Um, People trying to hit money because of inflation with everything else. Um, but also yeah, uh, so they can get by Ford gas. <laughs> yeah, they can afford gas, exactly. Um, but I mean it's good. And then also the story I think is gonna lead to a very successful preakness too, with this horse running and everybody rooting for that underdog. Um, somebody actually put that this was horrible for the sport. There's no way this was horrible for the sport. This was this was great for the sport. The only thing that was bad for everybody else is you're ripping up your tickets. But as far as storyline, it was great. The only the only way this is bad is if it ends up like it ended up last year, right? A couple of days from now, we get some unwanted news. But that race didn't look like like last year when the race was over. I immediately, and you can attest to this, I said something didn't look right about that. And then um, everybody's kind of making fun of me. And then Sean, a couple of days later sends me a text oh bleep again mm -hmm. somebody tested positive so um that one looked like a normal horse race to me so i don't expect that we'll see anything along those lines because you had the fast pace early on and then you had the horses come from off the pace which is pretty normal stuff um so i you know, i read too many articles about you know it's the kentucky derby you know it's the highlight of horse racing but it's going to go to the wayside no matter what happens blah 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 there's no way something that's generating 175 100, 179 million dollars of betting in one race is going to the wayside there's just way too much money at stake i will say one one thing some people have suggested and it could be true is this horse could be like mine the mine that bird where it wins that horse at a long shot and doesn't win a race again. But hopefully that's not true. Well, we'll find out, right? I, I mean, a lot of people don't expect it to win the next race either. It'll be a bit different setup, shorter field, won't be as fast, and speed probably holds a little bit better at Pimlico. We'll find out, right? Yep.
Why was the 20 scratch? Was Baffert involved? No, the 20 was scratched. What was wrong with the thermal road? Are you a little sick or something? No, I, I don't really know if he was sick. It just, the connections just felt like they weren't going to do it. They didn't have the a shot. Road, they, you know, the way the horse was working out, you know, it just wasn't, wasn't going to happen. Maybe um, they regret it right now. <laughs> he yeah, was a closer maybe. too, right? Yeah. Maybe yeah. could have taken that same ride. Just went right to the rail and said, okay, here we go. Yeah, so I'm sure follow up from that race, Sean, uh, the, Bob Baffert, the horses, Tabia, and Messier, which are now in the Yak Team Barn, will not be running in the Preakness. Yeah, that's no surprise. Then. I was actually surprised when after the race or Monday, you know, well, it wouldn't have been Monday morning, but you kind of got the maybe on Sunday morning. Um, I figured neither one would be running in the Preakness. Yeah, they always take a hold. I expect to see one or maybe both of them in the uh, Kentucky. I don't know. Maybe they're not just – I don't know if they're going to run at Belmont or not. The closers tend to be the ones that skip and then come back and run into Belmont. Maybe front runners really aren't the ones that want to do that, I don't think, anyway. So from the Kentucky Derby to the Breeders' Cup, Sean, you could have bought some tickets today if you're interested in going to Keeneland this November, Sean. I'm certainly interested in doing that. So you can head over to the Breeders' Cup and get your 2022 tickets as we start to look forward already to the end of the Triple Crown and to the beginning of the Breeders' Cup. I can't wait. We'll see, I'm sure, some of these horses at Keeneland later on in the year, wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing how we go from the Derby to let's think about the Breeders' Cup. There are so many races in between, um, and that might be part of the thing, too. It's kind of like the Super Bowl in football. Like We got you know all this other stuff, um, so hopefully some fans stay tuned for the ride between the Triple Crown and the Breeders' Cup as well. Speaking of other stuff, we got some other stuff, too, coming up this week. Some names that we talked about, Sean. Why don't you share um, some of our upcoming guests? So we have Ronnie Ebanks on tomorrow. He was a former jockey, jockey agent, motivational speaker, all kinds of stuff. He just released a book. We'll have him on start the show tomorrow. After Mm -hmm. he leaves, probably around like 8.20 p.m. Eastern, we will have on um, Kentucky Derby winning trainer Eric Reed. And then uh, Wednesday, we'll have apprentice jockey Courtney Gerardo on. And then Thursday, we're going to do a special Horse Center show at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. And we're going to have the winning jockey, Sonny Leone, on. Hmm. So you're going to make sure you catch that. How many other places can you go? And and you can ask questions, like you see. Make sure you're here when we have on Mr. Reed and we have on Sonny Leone. And ask your questions to the connections that just won the Kentucky Derby amazingly and where else can you do that? I mean, you certainly don't get the opportunity to ask Tom Brady how it felt. Exactly. And I've been getting the question a lot about the whole post-race thing that's been the talk. With the I horse wanting to attack everybody. Yeah, I seen Eric everybody Reed around? Address, I seen Eric Reed address that. We will bring that up. I will leave him. He answered that perfectly. That will give a little bit more. I'm you sure know, the horse is just fiery, man. That's yeah, it's probably it, his personality. You know, you know get, was like, He's like, this is my spotlight. You get the hell out of here. I don't know if Rich is always like – Rich usually has the answers. But I get the question sometimes. I'm like, you know what? I, I can't answer it 100%. This is my thoughts, but I, I don't know. Because we're not – you know, like we've said, we want to be around horses more and stuff, but we're not. Rich rode a horse one time, and that's the last time Rich will ever ride a horse. So, <laughs> um, He had his eye on the girl up the hill, man. He wasn't worried about me. Yeah, so we need more uh, knowledge and you know expertise on that. We'll never, we'll never pretend to know all that. We get the answers elsewhere on that. Mm-hmm. So we'll find out. I think he's probably just, he probably just has that personality, right? <laughs> Leave me alone. I did my job. Now I want to go back to the barn and, and eat. All right, Sean, well, that wraps this update today. Um, Terry and I, we, uh, we tried our hand at Philadelphia today. I did hit my box it up and I was alive to two horses for the Philly five. And unfortunately, neither one of them came home first, which just drives me absolutely Bananas. So I wonder why always the last race, when you got the first four in the bag, why you can't hit that fifth one. It just drives me nuts. But so that, were they closer? Nah. It looked like the six horse had a shot um, later in the race, but he, he kind of faded and the horses ran by him at the end. So that kind of messed me up. But I was happy with the pick with the box it up. I got the exacta, the superfecta, and the trifecta. Uh, the 10 cent superfecta paid 44 bucks. So hopefully you went ahead and did that. So that's a where else can you turn a dollar twenty into 44 bucks in a minute and a half? Not many places. No, not many places at all. Looking forward to making more money with you guys next week. We're looking forward to as well. Um, and then good call on the six. Finally, thanks for the info. Had fun. We appreciate it, William. We'll be back tomorrow, Terry and I, with Thistle Downs at 12 o'clock 
Eastern. So make sure you check that out. The best way to do that is to hit the subscribe button while you're on YouTube and the bell. So when we go live, you're notified. For us, if you like what you see, please give us a thumbs up on YouTube. Like us on Facebook. The more thumbs up we get, the higher we go up their algorithms. You've heard me say that a million times. Want to thank Susan Wright, Kirby Selman, also um, John Caravu, Steve Goodrich, Philip Heidenreich. I hope I got that right. With my last name, I should get them German names right. Robert Bryan and Mike Watkins for giving us a thumbs up, a like on Facebook. We appreciate it. If you do like they do, we'd appreciate it as well. Uh, I got uh, one shout out to uh, Zalima D. D. Wheats, who's commented a bunch, helped with uh, getting a trainer and the jockey on. So shout out to her, too. We appreciate it. And some pictures she provided for us as well, yes. right? along along with Sarah L. Bodway, which we appreciate as well. She gave us the picture with uh, um, uh, Rich Strike with the rose, uh, with the uh, wearing the bed of roses. The blanket yeah, absolutely. Rose. We appreciate everybody's help with that kind of stuff. We appreciate it. I mean, everybody's been helping us, Sean. So we, we, yeah. we wholeheartedly appreciate that. All right. That takes us wire to wire on Monday. We're going to have action pack this week, extra day on Thursday. So Sean can put away the tissues till Thursday. Doesn't have to take them out on Wednesday. Like always till we meet up again tomorrow with Terry for thistle downs until then, we hope everybody has a fantastic Monday night and may your night and your day until we catch up again, end up in our good friend, Jay Marcos. Winner circle. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great evening.